On behalf of the Pharmacy Legislative Week team, we are so excited to welcome you to our virtual panel on pharmacists and advocacy. And I am excited to co-host tonight's pa uh, panel with Rachel. If you have not signed in yet, please go ahead and scan this code, or you can go ahead and also click on the link here to enter for the raffle tonight. Thanks, Shivani. Um, just a few housekeeping rules before we get started. As this panel is being recorded, we are asking students to please mute themselves and take a moment to sign in to enter the raffle, which we'll draw at the end of the event. And we invite Dr. April Nguyen, founder of the Pharmacy Legislative Week, and to introduce PLW and Pharmacy Advocacy Month. Thanks, Rachel and the team for inviting me to speak tonight. Um, just wanted to share when I started Pharmacy Legislative Week in 2014, I think, as a student, we didn't have these kind of virtual panels. So I'm really excited to work with the team to promote the role of pharmacists and advocacy. And my current day to day job is a regulatory affairs manager in industry, and it's not tied directly to this topic. But I, want, I do want to highlight that regardless of your practice setting, you know, whether or not you're wearing a white coat, we are all advocates for the profession and the patients we serve. So I'm really thankful we can have this conversation with some great panelists tonight. I'm equally thankful to all the students who joined us. Um, I know some folks have already started introducing themselves on the chat, but I'd love it if you take a moment to type maybe your name, your school, um, your graduating year, or even your state. And while you're doing that, I'll share some more about Pharmacy Legislative Week, or PLW for short. So this originally started as a passion project when I was a student at the University of the Pacific, and we actually only originally held events during the end of October with other American Pharmacist Month activities. This year, PLW is super excited to double our programming through a five-week celebration of Pharmacy Advocacy Month in collaboration with student pharmacists in Canada to highlight these health care disparities in marginalized communities. And we'll continue to request city proclamations and push for provider status, as you see on the photos on the screen here. And it's been, I think, seven years since this was first created, but PLW remains a student-led and student-driven group committed to engaging and empowering students in building healthier communities, regardless of their class, occupation, religion, disability, condition, race, age, or gender. And since then, we've expanded leadership opportunities for students from 38 schools of pharmacy with the creation of eight student committees. So I'd like to give a special thanks and welcome to the virtual panel team who is hosting this event today. Thank you, April. Um, oops, okay. I'll start by introducing the team for our Pharmacist Legislative Week virtual panel team. My name is Shivani Modi and I am currently a P3 at Notre Dame of Maryland University School of Pharmacy. Um, I have been associated with PLW for about almost a year now and it's been an exciting journey. Um, and it's, it's been a wonderful to be the part of the family and I will pass this on to Rachel. Hi everyone, my name is Rachel Dietrich. I am currently a first year pharmacy student at Roseman University of Health Sciences in Henderson, Nevada, which is located right outside of Las Vegas. Um, this is my first year as a volunteer for PLW's team and I have learned so much from this experience already and I look forward to learning more in the next coming months. I'd pass it off to Christine. Hi, uh, my name is Christine Tang and I am a uh, P2 here at Roseman University, same as Rachel. Um, I've been working with PLW for almost a year as well. And it's super fun to, you know, um, spread the word and awareness about how to advocate pharmacy and working with April or Dr. April Nguyen has been amazing. Um, she's super inspiring and I hope you guys can also get involved as well. Thank you. And April, oh, Dr. Nguyen. It's okay, you can call me April. There's a lot of doctors out there. Um, I know you've already heard from me earlier, so I'll go ahead and keep my introduction brief. My name is April Wing, and I go by she, her, hers pronouns. I'm currently a regulatory affairs manager, and I started a community of practice for pharmacists at my company to highlight the diverse role of pharmacists in the industry. We're excited to welcome our three panelists to the virtual stage, starting with Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer as our first panelist. So I'd like for all the students and folks in attendance to give a warm welcome to Dr. Pam Schweitzer, who you'll see her bio on the next slide. Um, she's my mentor and the first female chief pharmacist officer. She served a four-year term as the assistant surgeon general and as the 10th chief pharmacist officer of the United States Public Health Service. Um, I'll go ahead and give Shivani a moment to catch up with the slides. 
Perfect. And um, the Rear Admiral was responsible for coordinating over 1,300 health service pharmacy officers across 13 agencies. Um, she's been recognized for her numerous leadership and personal contributions, and since her retirement in 2018 has continued to work on a number of public health related projects to improve health and access to healthcare in rural communities. Again, please welcome the Rear Admiral Pam Schweitzer. I'll unmute myself. This is my COVID hair, you guys. <laughs> I don't, you, yeah, my COVID hair, it got longer and I haven't had it. I tried to avoid getting cut. First of all, I can't tell you how excited I am to be here. And Dr. Wynn, you are, let me just tell you, I met her when I was CPO and I got to work with her every time. So, and I knew of you think, I think beforehand we met at another, we introduced like all these rock stars. I, I had a chance to meet her from California and she is a definite rock star and it. it's like you want to see where where someone's going to go in their career. So I'm really proud of you for getting this group together. And actually, I'm going to just reinforce again how how great that is um, that you um, that you're getting pulling the students in. So I'm going to just chat a little bit. I have to I, I think back you guys have been out or you're in it like early on. And I'm thinking back many years ago to when I got involved and in kind of how I was. And I'm going to share a little bit of, I'm going to say some of the qualities or things that I am. I have never changed. I'm the same person. And so I'll just talk a little bit about that. And as long as I can remember, and they asked me to address a question. And my, do I do my question right now? Do I jump um, right in? Not yet. We're going to actually introduce the other panelists and then we'll have um, some questions oh, then I can do right my afterwards. Question. Okay. So anyway, it's really great to be here. Thank you. I'll be quiet. Thank you. Welcome again. Thank you, Dr. Schweitzer. It's nice to have you. Um, next, we would like to welcome is Dr. Nimit Jindal. He is the current ACCP ASHP VCU Congressional Healthcare Policy Fellow. His current placement is with the United States Senate Health Education, Labor and Pension, commonly known as HELP Committee. Dr. Jindal has received his Doctor of Pharmacy degree from um, Rutgers University and completed a PGY-1 community-based residency with the UNC Eshelman School of Pharmacy. He was also appointed as the 2018-2019 APH Academy of Student Pharmacists National President. And he was a member of the APH Board of Trustees as well. Dr. Jindal is also very active in local politics and has served as the policy intern for now New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy, who was later elected to a two-year term as the Piscataway Township Ward for as a committeeman. Welcome, Dr. Jindal. Hey, thanks so much, Shivani. Really excited to be here. Uh, I'm really looking forward to the questions and answers later on in the in the panel today. So I'm really happy. Thanks. Next up, we'd like to welcome Dr. Murphy. Dr. Murphy is co-founder of the Grassroots Pharmacist, a blog that aims to inspire the action of pharmacists and student pharmacists to help transform health policy and patient access to a quality affordable health care. He is currently a fellow at Ohio State University College of pharmacy and part of the Ohio Pharmacists Association to help advocate and implement pharmacist provider status. He earned his doctorate of pharmacy in 2018 and completed a PGY-1 in ambulatory care in 2019. As a student pharmacist, he was actually the national president of APHA ASP and a member of the APHA Board of Trustees from 2017 to 2018. Welcome, Dr. Murphy. Thanks everyone, excited to be here and honored to be on a panel with uh, Dr. Jindal, Jindal and Dr. Schweitzer. Thank you to all our panelists, we're excited to have you. Um, so before we move on to the panel co-moderated by myself and Rachel, we would invite all the students to drop any questions for our panelists in the chat. We ask that you remain on mute and one of our moderators will ask the questions at the end if time allows. We will get started and we will move on to our first question for the night. Um, so how would you describe your journey through pharmacy and as an advocate for the profession? And we would start with Dr. Schweitzer and followed by Dr. Jindal and Dr. Murphy. Okay, so anyway, thanks for that question. Um, so I would say it's actually more, not so much an advocate for the profession, but as long as I can remember, it's been more of an advocate for the patient. So, and, and what ends up happening, any topic where the word medication came up, my ears kind of perk up because I think pharmacists should be involved in that. So sort of this is back when I was a student even, medication, oh, pharmacy should be at the table. 
and I, I, I got involved more from just, and a lot of it was policy work, probably more at the, wherever I was working, you know, the hospital or the pharmacy, wherever I was working, but it was just questioning things like what, what's driving something. It could be simple, something simple, like why aren't people picking up their medications? Why aren't they, why don't they come pick them up? And then just digging into it and looking, looking into that. And I have not changed. I am still like that to this day, like trying to figure out what, what is causing something and digging in and figuring it out. And when it's a policy or when it's a regulation or it's a law or a statute, working on it. So um, early in my career, we like in Indian Health Service, and this is what's leading to some of the other projects. We were, we, I spent a lot of time in Indian Health Service. We, what we did is we actually had um, these protocols and we took care of all the minor elements, UTIs, URIs, we were prescribing antibiotics and we were prescribing back then, but we were doing it under protocol. Our reason for doing that was because it was so much easier if we could take care of those easier ailments so that it wouldn't bog down the clinic. So finances were involved. Later on, finances got involved and that caused the workflow to change because people wanted to bill. So you get an idea. So that's why there's this big push, at least personally I am, push public health because we should be able to take care of these ailments. I think later on, I had to learn how to talk to the C-suite and there's a different language and having data and graphs that happened over time. So I think data and graphs and just being able to use data, to, you need data to be able to talk to C-suite, that's so critical. And just basically my whole career has been about solving problems that have to do with medications that, to help the, that help the patient. And it's a marathon, not a sprint. And it's about relationships and stakeholders. And um, I can tell a little bit more stories later on, but I'm trying to keep my limit. But that, anyway, that's, that's, um, that's my journey. I didn't get into the minutia detail because I've had 30 years of it, but um, that's, it kind of grew all along. So then I did policy towards the end, a lot of policy. I do a lot of writing and I write to my congressman all the time right now. <laughs> I write congressmen and senators all the time. So. Um, Dr. Jindal. Yeah, uh, Dr. Schweitzer, I'm really glad that you're writing to members of Congress. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm getting some great correspondence from constituents on my time in the Hill. So uh, you all are informing a lot of the decisions for sure. I, I think it's, you know, I really don't think you can talk about uh, being a pharmacist and, and having a journey in pharmacy uh, without at the same time talking about being an advocate for the profession, because I think, you know, essentially they both are one and the same, which, which I think is a little bit ironic. Uh, just sort of coming back from, from my experience as, as I was uh, starting off early on in, in my uh, professional career, I actually used to work at an independent pharmacy. My dad was an independent owner for, for many years. And so like any you know, family owned business, uh, you work every summer, you work every weekend, you know, there, re there really is no break because uh, you've got to do what you got to do to support the family. And so, um, you know, one of the things that I found incredibly interesting was uh, the, the question of uh, that, that Dr. Schweitzer was saying about why patients don't pick up meds and, and you know, outside of the clinical reason um, behind all of that and some of these social determinants of health that we're, we're now starting to really target, um, I was always drawn to the fact that patients would come to the counter, see their copay, and then refuse to pick up a medication. And so I, uh, I think my focus on advocacy really got, got it, it was those experiences that really sucked me in into the advocacy space. And so I did not think that pharmacy had opportunities for advocacy. So when I was in high school and looking for, for you know, experiences afterwards, I thought poli-sci was going to be the way to go. And unfortunately, and or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, fate had, uh, had different plans. I got rejected from every poli-sci program I applied to. I only got into Rutgers Pharmacy. And so my initial plan was I was going to spend two years and transfer out. And it wasn't until I got in uh, into the pharmacy program and I got uh, involved with, with a lot of these associations that I got to see that these things are very hand in hand. And, you know, there was a natural curiosity then that, you know, all right, so I'm in pharmacy, I understand the issues, I see by virtue of my experiences on rotations, some of the questions that I have about patients access to medications, patients access to 
overall healthcare. So let me dig a little bit deeper. And so that is a little bit of how I ended up, you know, going the association route. I wanted to, to get involved with the American Pharmacist Association. I wanted to understand what nonprofits and what national advocacy organizations do to advocate for patients, what my role would be like as a student. And then when I graduated, I think there was still a lot of that natural curiosity. I went on and, and, and in my community pharmacy residency, we were in a, a remote rural setting about an hour outside of Charlotte. And, and if you know North Carolina, what you'll know is there's only cities and rural areas, there's no suburbs. Um, and so, you know, in, in these rural communities, you start working with independent practitioners because there are no health systems or the closest health system is an hour away. And so when you're working with these independent providers, now you're not looking about professional advocacy, but you're saying, how do I get the patient what they need right then and there? So I'm, I'm an advocate for my patient. And obviously the, the subtext to all of this is we're in the worst, we're in the uh, worst public health emergency that we, we've been in in a, in a century. And so advocating for patients, especially as a provider became so much more urgent. And so I had never had more face time with North Carolina's uh, State Department of Medicaid. I had, you know, I had so many more conversations with the, the chairman of the, of the Board of Pharmacy. And so I think all of those interactions just kept me more and more curious about institutions and infrastructure and, and how do you be a better advocate for some of these policy things. And so when there was an opportunity to come to the Hill, you know, where this is at, at, at some cases probably where the highest level of policy development is happening, I was just fascinated and really drawn to that. And so, you know, if I had to describe in one word, you know, what has been pulling this journey through, it's curiosity. Um, and it's, it's really trying to understand uh, as much of it as you can. And, and I'm sure what a lot of people will say, and, and Dr. Murphy and Dr. Schweitzer would agree, is the more you learn, the more questions you end up having. So there's like this never ending cycle of, of being curious and wanting to be engaged with professional advocacy, which, uh, you know, being a very recent grad is very exciting and very fulfilling for me. Okay, and I, I think that I'll, I'll wrap us up. Um, so for me, I, I would say that my journey started similarly to Dr. Jindal and Dr. Schweitzer um, with really recognition as a student pharmacist that there are a lot of health disparities that our patients face. And there's different things that cause limited access to patient care. And I guess if, if I could pick one word that kind of threads through mine, in addition to curiosity, like, like Dr. Jindal said, it's probably optimism. My thought that the way the current system is right now cannot be as good as it can be. There's got to be things that can improve it. And through different, um, through different experiences that I have, largely getting involved in professional organizations, similar to PLW, I, I also went down the route of getting involved in the American Pharmacists Association. Um, I, I got to participate in different advocacy initiatives, talk to elected leaders and members of Congress. And it is so empowering to walk into a room with someone that you just assume because they're an elected leader, they have to know everything about these issues. And then you sit down and they ask you a question and you're like, oh, wow, I'm the expert in the room. I'm the expert on pharmacy. And I can really share my perspective, talk about patient care and the role of the pharmacist and can really truly make, uh, make an influence on that individual's understanding of the role and value of the pharmacist. So my journey has largely been through professional associations um, in advocating through different opportunities, going to Capitol Hill visits, going to student legislative days. Um, but behind all of that, there, there was a, a pretty consistent idea of the importance of community organizing, of working with members of my community to talk about these issues, to write letters to our state lawmakers, to write letters to our federal lawmakers, and really increase our civic engagement on talking about these issues. Um, and we've seen uh, through some of those efforts that we've you know, changed some perspectives on you know, voting on an issue of, about pharmacist provided care or including a provision in a bill or a rule based on us just getting involved. So um, that's, that's the one thing that I'll share uh, is be curious, but also be optimistic. Uh, the, the current healthcare system, the current profession of pharmacy, 
it's got to improve. And we are going to be the ones that can work to improve that. And that can happen right now uh, as you're a student pharmacist. And after you graduate, if you go into residency or if you go into fellowship, an academic fellowship similar to mine, um, you can definitely be a part of that optimistic approach and engagement to improve the system overall. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. Thank you, Dr. Schweitzer. And thank you, Dr. Jindal, for sharing your experiences. Um, I'm sure what you said definitely resonated with all our students here. Um, the next question for tonight is, where do you see the profession of pharmacy in five to 10 years? I'd like to start first with Dr. Jindal, then Dr. Murphy, and then Dr. Schweitzer. So Dr. Jindal, if you'd like to go ahead and answer the question. Yeah, I, I think this might be one of the hardest questions uh, of all the ones that you've you've sort of had listed. And, you know, partly the reason for that is, is the healthcare environment is always changing. Um, and so it's very hard to pick down and say in, in five to 10 years, you know, what's going to happen. You know, I, I remember just getting started learning about some of these health policy issues, you know, two years ago or three years ago and seeing how different the landscape is now. So to project that far ahead, I think is a little bit challenging. But I, I, I will say this is, and I don't mean this in a, in a dig in any sort of way, but I, I feel like the pharmacy profession for some time has sort of had its head in the sand when it comes to the issues it engages with. And, and, and that's not to say that issues like provider status aren't important or issues like payment reform aren't important. But I think that when you look at the healthcare environment, things have moved so drastically around it. Right. So Medicare generally has moved to a value based system, you know, uh, after passage of, of, of MACRA and, and the advanced payment models or MIPS and, and these value based payment structures, you know, we're really trying to focus a lot on value. And, you know, my my question. So value integrated care, coordinated care. We've got ACOs and, and, and patient center medical homes and and all of these different care practices that are coming through and every, you know, so on and so on, uh, every so often. You know, payment advisory committees are putting out new recommendations on how they want to pay for for healthcare services. So, I the reason why I say that is because, you know, you look at pharmacy in general and sort of what its position has been, and it's been in my mind, and, and I remember being uh, going to the hill to advocate for provider status as a student. But it's very it's pharmacy centered, right? It's we are the pharmacist, we are the pharmacy. We, these are what we're trained to do. This is our training. Um, pay us for this. And it's never really fit, I, I think, as I've had conversations with lawmakers and, and other staffers on the Hill, there's really never a clear understanding of how does this fit into the overall model of coordinated care. So that's, that's sort of the challenge that I think the profession has to overcome when it comes to that issue. So for example, you look at the issue of provider status, uh, where we are right now. Primary care providers are seeing a drastic shortage uh, of, the, of their workforce over the next 10 years. And COVID has only exacerbated some of those concerns. And so if you tell a primary care provider that is working in a rural setting or even in an urban setting that, hey, we're looking to get pharmacists to be able to get paid to do some of the, the basic clinical services that you do for patients, that you bill uh, Medicare or Medicaid for, um, there's obviously going to have some concerns because historically, when we've allowed nurse practitioners or PAs to bill for services, it's, it's come out of their ability to claim ownership over a certain set of services. And so I think the challenge, what, what pharmacy has to start positioning itself for, if we are going to be competitive uh, in the future in, in terms of our clinical expertise is how do we partner with those, those workforce elements that are already there, as opposed to just trying to stake out our own claim. And so I think you've got one railway that's running of the changing payment model. Um, then I think you've also got this other railway of serious healthcare reform. So the American Rescue Plan Act that the president signed last month is the single largest expansion of healthcare coverage since the passage of the ACA. And so there's obviously going to be considerable concerns about, you know, what does this mean now for payments? You know, what does this mean for the patients that are on private insurance who have gotten uh, subsidies from the government? And now there's an, uh, costs might go up. And now there's everyone is trying to come back and say, how do we coordinate some of these cares so that costs don't get out of concern? And then the last train that's really running at the same time are, are some of these social determinants of health and some of these healthcare disparities. We realize that healthcare just isn't about being able to pick up medication. Healthcare just isn't about being able to see a doctor, but it's what kind of housing do you have access to? What kind of nutritional uh, services do you get? What type of social support services do you get? And so if, if we're gonna continue to look at healthcare more holistically, which 
I'm not upset about. I think this is the best thing to happen to patient care in a very, very long time is this uh, paradigm shift of how we look at taking care of patients. But I think if pharmacy is going to evolve with that setting, we have to start looking at this as how do we fit in with the broader picture? How do we partner with social services, with our social health workers or our, our, our physicians, our, uh, our, our food banks, all of these different entities? How do we partner with them so that we're at the table and we're not asking to own the table, right? And so I think if you ask me in five to 10 years, and I hope this is this is with the caveat that pharmacy recognizes this. And I think there is a lot of movement. There's a lot more discussions about racism and, and the role that race plays in healthcare access and health disparities. But I think if, if pharmacy is gonna be competitive, and I hope it is, I would hope that in five to 10 years, we see ourselves as part of the solution. And, and we look at the solution being this broader picture and not just payment reform being the answer to this. And so um, it's a complicated question, but I, I hope that that's enough uh, of a segue. And I know Dr. Murphy and Dr. Schweitzer are going to provide some some insight on that as well. No, I think I think you did a great job answering that question. Thank you, Dr. Jindal. Um, and then Dr. Murphy, if you'd like to go ahead and answer the question. I would also like to say that I think Dr. Jindal did a fantastic job on that last question. Um, the, yeah, I, I agree. This is a hard question to, to answer. And I think there's a lot of different directions that we could take. We could talk about how, you know, if there is a change in the underlying business model of, of how pharmacists bring in revenue for the businesses that they work for, um, if we do accomplish provider status and patients pick it up and, you know, physicians are excited to work with us and pharmacists are willing to change how they practice, will there be something like a primary care pharmacist out in your community providing prophylactic services and helping to manage your medications? Maybe that could happen. But I think the biggest fundamental thing that we're going to have to talk about over the next five to 10 years is our association with the dispensing of medications. I think that we've continued to see that technology and automation and support staff have a big role in the dispensing of medications. And for the longest time in our profession, we have really associated our value as pharmacists with the handing over of the product. Of course, I'm a pharmacist, so I just have one of these. Oh, you can't see it. Sitting on my desk. But we've largely associated our value with when we hand over this product to a patient. But over the next five to 10 years, you know, maybe Amazon really comes into the marketplace and they're able to get you your medications um, to your door the same day and it's very cheap and, it, and it's very accessible to patients and it's good for patients. Patients are able to take their medicines more. We should want what is good for patients. We should advocate for what's good for patients. But I also believe that the education that we receive as pharmacists is valuable. And the clinical services, the cognitive services that we can provide to our patients are important. And are, we have great value as members of the healthcare team. So I don't know what the answer to that question will be, what our eventual role will be with the dispensing of medications, but I think that things will change. There's going to be some disruption in the marketplace when it comes to the dispensing of medicines. And we're going to have to figure out where the ideal role of the pharmacist is. And that's why I'm so excited to see so many students on this call, because we get to answer that question together. Um, and it all starts with you sparking your curiosity and getting involved in things like this. So I'll stop now and turn it over to the real expert, uh, Dr. Schweitzer. No, no, I'm not the real expert. So anyway, this is great that you... I'm just going to say, because everybody, you guys did, did such a great job of addressing this, and I'm just going to fill in and add a little other thing. So I've had the um, honor of when, during my retirement, what I'm always listening for and what I'm always going to and participating in and attending and, and reading is really the direction of healthcare. And prior to the current administration, I knew there wasn't a lot of work being done in healthcare, but there was a lot of work being done by all the think tank. And those people now are in, in office or they're working somewhere and they're going to be implementing. So I'm sharing with you what I see at least happening for a little bit that I think is going to happen. And what I'm hoping that the pharmacy profession is part of that. And I agree with everything that they said up to now. And I'm just going to add a, a, just a little bit different 
version of it. I, I think there's a great opportunity and it's already happening. You see it a little bit with pharmacists, it, the ones in, in the community pharmacy space, you know, direct patient care type pharmacists getting more into public health. There's gonna be so much emphasis on public health. Now, the question is, you know, are we, whether the pharmacists are gonna do it. There's a lot of regulations that have changed that to allow pharmacists to do a little bit more, they're gonna go away at the end of the pandemic. And the question is, are we gonna be, we need all the advocacy now to keep some of these going. There's a lot of telehealth, but I will tell you, remember I'm working with everybody, pharmacy too. There's a lot of groups out there that are gonna get into this space. So it's sort of like um, there's some opportunities out here and it's really about whether pharmacy is gonna be able to kind of get in there and work collaboratively. Something that stuck in my head that when I go, because I go talk, I was at CMS and I talked to them all the time and it stuck into my head and I'm going to share it with you because it changed me on how I approach everything. The, what they kept on saying, you pharmacists keep on coming in. This group comes in and tells us this thing. This group comes in and tells us this thing. So obviously we don't have one voice yet. But the one thing is if you guys are so great and you're doing all these things, how come everybody isn't asking for you? Why aren't the health plans? Why? So I know in Ohio is a little bit different, but this needs to be across the board where we need to have a pharmacist on the team. We need to have a pharmacist part of this here. There are so many places where they're managing medications and I look and there's no pharmacist listed. Well, where's the pharmacist? Where are they? And even when I remember in my, in my days working, you know, you'd go there and the pharmacist wasn't at the table. Well, they were invited, they couldn't make it, they're too busy. So I'm, I'm saying this because you're coming into your career right now. Those are the opportunities you never want to miss is being at the table and, and participating and being part of the solution. And that's how we need to be engaged. Um, reimbursement models. So I'm going to differ a teeny bit. I, you know, I tracked that CMS. I was kind of tracking about like all the different um, models, payment models that are out there, you're going to see some new payment models because, and there's going to be different payment models. And so we need to pay attention to them to make sure we're at the table when it has to do with medications. It, it, it'll be different than now because not all of them worked like we thought they were going to work. Some of them, they were happy when they came out even. A lot of them don't even save a lot of money. So, so we're going to have to be at, be at the table to figure all this out. The other thing is that we are providers in some ways in several states right now. And part of the problem is we're not implementing. So we need implementers. We need people that, that once the payment's there can get these programs off the ground. That's a special skill set to get programs off the ground. And I, I think we're not gonna get there unless we do these pushing, you know, keep pushing to like, now we can get paid, but we're leaving money on the table because we don't implement a program. So telehealth is gonna be big. There's 12 states that don't have Medicaid expansion um, you're seeing right now, I'm, I'm listening for it and I know what's going on right now. They're gonna probably put big incentives to expand. That means that the adult population, chronic medications for those states at North, North Carolina is one of them, by the way. So um, they're gonna be a lot more expansion of the state. So that, those are great opportunities for the pharmacists, you know, collaborative care to provide that. So um, I think one thing that we need to do a probably a better job is making sure we're having one voice as we go and we can kind of agree what that direction is. And I agree to just like, um, I, I agree to just like you were saying is that, you know, part of the thing is we're, we can't do this alone. We have to have, we have to do this as a team and show how we can fit at the team. So I'm really involved in Medicaid. That's a space I'm in right now. And it's one state at a time making those changes, but it's moving. It's finally moving. It's just, we got to keep it going after COVID. Yes, 100% agree. Thank you everybody for sharing your answers. I'd like to pass it off to Shivani now for the next question. Thank you, Rachel. And thank you, Dr. Schweitzer. Those were some wonderful insights to the future of our pharmacy. Um, our next question is, where do you see the profile? Oh, sorry. What's an advocacy story that stood out to you during your time as a pharmacist? And we will start with Dr. Murphy, followed by Dr. Schweitzer and Dr. Jindal. This is a, this is a great question. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is um, 
So in my role at Ohio State, um, I, I get the opportunity to work with a lot of students. Um, and part of my role is really empowering them to increase their civic engagement and to get more involved in advocacy efforts. And um, this is just something recent that happened, but, but really made my day. But um, a student was taking one of my classes. And of course, uh, one of my assignments that I have the students complete is writing a letter to their legislator about an issue that they're passionate about. Um, I'm, I'm kind of known as the crazy advocacy guy at, at Ohio State, which I appreciate. Um, but the student did a really nice job. They really researched the letter, the issue. Um, they wrote it very persuasively and they sent it to their member of Congress. Uh, they're, they're originally back from Illinois. And they heard back almost immediately from their member of Congress that the member of Congress was so impressed with this letter that they wanted to meet with them to talk about this idea that they had for a piece of legislation. Um, I haven't followed up with the student yet to hear about how the meeting went um, and, and what's happening with it, but it, it just really warmed my heart to see and say, hey, you know, maybe it does make sense that we're doing this assignment uh, and maybe it will make a difference. So um, that's my, my brief advocacy story of just something recent that um, was pretty, pretty exciting. That's a great, that's a great story. Do you mean to go? Yes, please. Okay, yeah, that was a great story. You know, along that same line, and I'm just going to tell you, I know that you always, they do ledge day, legislative day, and you go as a group, and you go visit them in DC. I don't know, do you still do that? Go visit in Washington, DC? We've had, I know, Senator Grassley, you guys probably heard of that name, he's from Iowa. He'd come to these meetings, and he goes, I know you guys all come and visit us in Washington, but let me give you a hint. It's actually way better if during our summer breaks or you know when they're on break or whatever if you schedule an appointment and you come visit us for so the so he's in Iowa like if you come visit us in like from, if you're from Iowa go visit him in when he's in Iowa he says that's so much more meaningful so that's why I've been like hitting up all the local people here and um, of course this summer you know what I'm going to be doing just hitting him up on certain topics and it'll be pharmacy related topics so anyway my story is, um, and thank you for asking for it because I had a chance to think about it. So it was sort of my first where the light bulb went on for me, like, oh, here's how you do this. And what happened was, is I had been working in the pharmacy for a while and um, we had to, you know, do some payment things or whatever. And we'd go up the chain of our organization and they would go, and this is really with Medicaid, make some changes. So they would go to meetings or whatever and come back and tell us something didn't work or it worked. And a little bit later on, I switched over and got in a new role. So then I found out they met regularly with Medicaid and it was a team of people. It was the CEOs, it was medical directors, it was the head of nursing, you know, it was different disciplines and then pharmacy, I gotta be at the table. And so we'd go in and it was a lot of it was sharing information, gathering data, presenting to them, sharing a concern, understanding the regulation that was keeping something from happening and, and then we would visit with them, they would understand the issue and they would say, okay, we get this, let us take it back and let's work on this and we'll get with you on the wording to make sure we have this right. So that process started realizing, oh, here's how you make change. And then I'd watch them get the wording together and they would submit it up the chain to Regent, the Region 9 at the time and go all to little path. It would take about a year to make those changes. But what it was, was everybody would get on board. It wasn't just pharmacy going in, it was everybody going in together. And that's when I realized it really does need to be comprehensive. We need to think about who are all the people that are gonna block it or say no to it because it's gotta be a publicly, it's gonna be, there's public comment. And if every time you put out public comment, the other side's gonna answer. So you gotta hit all those people before you put it out so you're all on the same page. The goal is not to have a lot of public comment or have everybody sort of in agree agreement with, before it goes out. So I learned how to, I'm gonna say smooth maybe, and just like play with the language and to negotiate, all that was done ahead of time. And um, so anyway, that happened, I was a pharmacist and then I went from there and then I took that same concept and I do this all the time, you guys. I package, th it's package things up, take my time, talk to all the people that are gonna do it, package it up and send it in. 
and one person can make it. I'm looking at because I know that our, our, my panelists, the panelists can do the same. One person actually can make a difference. It just needs someone to drive that process. Do you agree? A little bit? Yes. Yeah. Oh, I, I definitely agree. I'll, I'll pick up here. I, I, again, like I, a huge part of my uh, a job now at, uh, as, a, as a committee staffer is to work with constituents on a variety of legislative packages. And so um, whether they're individuals um, who are looking for more funding for disease states, uh, so NIH research or CDC research, or whether it's health insurance companies trying to uh, lobby for their certain provisions in, in our surprise medical billing package that passed last year. I mean, there's uh, one people or an industry of people can all make a difference. Uh, so that's definitely for sure. I, I think one of my favorite advocacy stories, and I'm going to make this as a student pharmacist advocacy story because of the audience that we've got here. But, but I remember when I was uh, in pharmacy school, New Jersey was one of uh, three states in the country that didn't let students immunize. Um, it was like, it was, it was strange. It was Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, uh, Pennsylvania got it. I think my P1 or P2 year and then New Jersey, uh, New Jersey, New York, were just battling it out for last place. Uh, New Jersey did get last place. So I, I don't know if that's a badge or if that's a problem, but I remember when I, uh, we had a, a an interesting relationship with our state association. And so I, uh, I had started that initial contact with the with the state association to be like, hey, you know, what's going on here? Like, why why is New Jersey not this? Like, you know, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're advocating for us and for students. And so, um, I I remember the the New Jersey state uh, the state association was like, well, it's a priority for us, but like we expect there's going to be some opposition from uh, from the chair of one of the committees that it had to get through, who was a doctor at the uh, who was a doctor who is a doctor. And so uh, it's because of that person, that's why we're not gonna be able to get this legislative pathway through. And so I, I took it at face value. I was a little skeptical about it, but I kept bringing it up. Uh, I kept trying to, to organize stuff with, with some students at our, at our school. And I remember we had a career day or, or some kind of day, and I ran into a representative from the New Jersey Retail Merchants Association. And so what the Retail Merchants Association is, is it's basically another organization that represents pharmacy but it's the box stores, right? It's the CVS, it's the Walgreens and, and so on and so forth. And so I had a conversation with them and I said, hey, you know, we're, we're, I, I have this fundamental question about why New Jersey isn't one of the states that can immunize, where, where students can immunize, um, you know, what can we do about this? And within a week, we had a tactical strategy in place about how we were gonna advocate for this specific policy proposal uh, at the state house. Now you can imagine that that made the New Jersey Pharmacists Association very upset um, because this was sort of their turf, this was their domain. And so within a week, the New Jersey Pharmacists Association came back with a tactical strategy. So something that they had not been willing to move for two or three years, all of a sudden they were like, oh, now it's possible. Like this doctor doesn't exist anymore. Magically poof out of thin air, this opposition was gone. And so what was really cool is that we had students go ahead and testify uh, in front of the committee. We've had um, a lot of students uh, take on this, this leadership role to kind of shepherd this process through. And so now, you know, almost uh, a couple of years after that, New Jersey is one of the, the states that can, where students can immunize. And so it, it's, it's really fascinating. I, I think it, it stands out for, for two reasons. A, there is no there's no credential that you need in order to be an effective advocate, right? I think a lot of people think I'm a student, I can't really do things, um, or let me wait until I'm a pharmacist. A, that's that's practically false. And even when I was a policy intern with the with Governor Murphy, uh, we had no pharmacists on our initial campaign team. And so they sent me out as a student to go and listen to pharmacy stakeholders. And just by being a pharmacist or a student, there's a little bit of credibility that comes with it. So you're not you're not automatically gone. And the second thing I would say is there are always multiple pathways to success, right? So if, if you get a barrier from one stakeholder group or you get a barrier from one uh, member of Congress or from whatever, there's a multiple different ways to get over there. Yes, it's gonna require some institutional knowledge. Yes, it might require some infrastructure uh, understanding. But I think if, if, you, if someone says that this is our only pathway and because there is a barrier that you can't do it, I would really challenge you to question that assertion, question that premise and think, okay, you know, what does this person have to gain? What are their biases? And, and really who else can we engage with? I think you will find 
that you will find partners in advocacy in the unlikeliest of, of places. You know, we never thought about going to the big box stores, uh, but that's an option. Reaching out to your medical societies, someone that's not necessarily pharmacy. Um, so I think that, you know, look for allies, look for supporters in, in, in places that you might not expect. But then whenever you get told no, keep being persistent, keep writing, keep calling, keep showing up, keep being engaged. Um, because I think at every level, when you do that, you're going to be a much more effective advocate. Even when they tell you no, you're going to learn a ton so that whenever you go back to the table to make that ask, you're going to be better qualified and better prepared uh, to do it a second or third or fourth or fifth time. Thank you, Jind um, thank you Dr. Jindal, for sharing your experiences and your thoughts. Um, we would move on to next question, Rachel. All right. Um, our next question is specifically for Dr. Murphy. So we touched a lot about provider status so far tonight. Um, so Dr. Murphy, while working with the Ohio Pharmacists Association to advocate for provider status, what is your perspective on the challenges that we are currently facing in the state and federal level towards this step? This is a, this is a great question. So I'll, I'll share quickly a, a little bit about my role and what we're currently doing here in Ohio. So I work closely with the Ohio Pharmacists Association uh, really on the implementation of provider status. So we passed the law here um, back in 2019 where pharmacists would be recognized as providers under our state Medicaid department, right? So pharmacists can bill for and receive reimbursement um, for the services that they're providing. We got provider status. Well, wait because there's more that needs to be done after we pass the law. Uh, at, we realized this, that after we passed the law, we actually had to write rules. The state uh, Medicaid department had to write rules about how pharmacists would function, how pharmacists would be credentialed, how they would work as providers. And that took uh, two more years. And we, we worked closely with the state Medicaid department to work on those rules, but really the, the big leveraging point that we were able to use is that there was all of this media attention that was drummed up talking about this issue and patients got interested. And because patients got interested in this issue, they started reaching out to their elected leaders and they started reaching out to um, their health insurance companies um, that work beneath our Medicaid department, um, our managed care organizations. And everyone got real riled up about this issue. And because of this, we ended up um, being able to work collaboratively with our managed care organizations or the health insurance companies that work underneath our Medicaid department um, to really implement provider status and help to move forward with all these extra steps that come after you actually pass the law. Um, so things have moved very quickly here. Um, I will say that we are figuring things out as we go, um, but a lot of the success that we've seen has come from us, as we've talked about tonight, bringing multiple stakeholders together and helping them to advocate for the pharmacist on behalf of the pharmacist. So where we are right now, provider status has been implemented and pharmacists as of January 17th can enroll with Medicaid, provide services and receive reimbursement. So we've gotten there, but there's still challenges. Uh, some of the challenges that we're facing here and that we'll continue to face in the future, not only here in Ohio, but across the country are helping patients to understand what these services are and getting them to come into the pharmacy to receive them. So just opening the door doesn't mean the patients are gonna come in. We need to help them to understand the value of pharmacist provided care and um, why it's important to their health. Um, working with other healthcare professionals and helping them to understand and work collaboratively with pharmacists is an issue um, that we're continuing to work on and, and talk with physicians. We, we realize that once physicians sign on, they see all of the benef benefit and they love it. But it definitely takes some time, some effort, and, and some TLC to get them to that point. And the last challenge that we're still facing right now is getting pharmacists to want to do this. Uh, a lot of pharmacists don't, they like the idea of provider status, but when we actually open the door, it can be scary. It's very, very different in how we practice in our day-to-day -day, um, responsibilities. 
And that can be scary for pharmacists. So helping them, support them, empowering them to change and increase access to, to patient care um, is, is some of the big challenges that we're working on right now. But um, things are improving. Patients love it that are they're walking through the door, but we need to continue not only to, to open that door, but to help encourage patients, other healthcare professionals, and pharmacists to walk through it. Thank you, Dr. Murphy, for sharing your story. I hope that there are other students on the call who were inspired by your story and they're able to take what they learned from your experience and put it into their own um, action to advocate for provider status in their own communities. Uh, Shivani, if you wanna go ahead and take the next question. Yes. Our next question is directed towards Dr. Schweitzer. Uh, what obstacles did you have to overcome to become the first female chief pharmacist officer? And the second part of that would be, how do you approach your role as both a pharmacist and a female in this profession? Thank you for that question. I'm glad you asked it. Uh, so first of all, um, I actually didn't think, wasn't thinking about obstacles or anything to overcome because I wasn't really trying to be a first female chief pharmacist officer. It sort of kind of just happened. And I had a lot of people encouraging me and giving me confidence. So it wasn't something I was trying for. So initially I wasn't thinking of obstacles, but I will tell you earlier in my, early in my career, I had a family, I had a husband and children and they were young. And so, you know, my focus has always been, been them. And I would never have done this role if, it, if the family thing wasn't right at the time. At the time, my kids now were in college then and my husband, of course, is super supportive. I have the best supportive husband in the world for my career. So, um, but but thinking about this, when I saw that question, when I thinking about this, I was aware in my career. I don't. Maybe it's not there now, but I I was aware that as I was doing things, and it didn't bother me at the time though, because I had young kids, and that's fine. I don't need to get involved. I know that I was not picked for certain little projects because because I was female and I had a family and I needed to go be take care of my family, which was fine. I wanted to take care of them. So I, it, I never got worked up about it. Um, I know there were times when, and I'm just telling you the things that I, cr I cringe now because I don't think they happen, but Hey, you want to come golfing? You can drive the golf cart. And I'm like, well, I can, I can play golf. You know, I could probably beat you. I mean, I'm joking a little bit, but um, you know, I th grew up with three brothers and I was very into sports. So if I needed to, I could have, but I was just choosing not to do all of that because I was, I love to work. I love my job. And so I had to really clear out for the profession. What I had to do is really kind of make sure that that the timing was right so that I, because I wanted to support my, make sure my family was okay. Cause they're the most important to me in the world. So family first. So that same thing, when I got in that position, then I started sharing a little bit about it because you don't need, you don't, you don't need to, I actually went up and down in my career a few times. I would go be a pharmacy chief and then I'd step down and be a staff later on. So it looked like I was going down and I had somebody tell me early in my career that what you're doing is destroying your career by going and taking, going up and taking a chief spot and then going down to a staff and I'm going, okay, I'm destroying my career. So, but it, that never really did destroy your career because you learn something everywhere you go. And, and it was great sometimes to work real hard and then take a kind of a break and have an easier job maybe. So I tried really hard to pull women together and to share some of these stories and make sure family stays first. And the other thing, and this is for the guys too, actually for guys and girls, is that I, I'm, I'm, a he, I'm hesitant. I'm del, I didn't have a lot of confidence that I could do it. And I had a lot of people encouraging me and giving me support and being mentors to me. And sometimes I have to be asked two or three times because I'm like, oh, I don't know if I can do that. But if somebody believed in me and they asked me, like the CEO said, Pam, I'd really like you to help with this. Oh, I don't know. I haven't done this very much. They would say it two or three times and okay, I'll give it a try. But it, it would change me. So Part of it was just, I learned to be more confident. And so I encourage people in their career, you know, if what I found out is you don't need to be the expert to try something. If you sort of have an idea and you have an interest, you know, try it, go, do it. And so that my career has all, 
been full of learning all these things that I never dreamed I'd be learning because I was curious. We talked about curious in the beginning, but just curious, how does this work? I'd like to learn this. So just having that curiosity, I think is really what, what helped me. And so hopefully I pass that on to um, the other officers when I was in that role. Actually, and now too, even. Thank you, Dr. Schweitzer. That was um, very inspiring, especially for us as uh, females in this profession to have that work-life balance. Um, and I think that's what most of us are watching for. Um, so it's definitely very enlightening to know that you were somebody who also um, watched for that. Mm -hmm. Our next question, um, Rachel. All right, our next question is for Dr. Jindal. Can you talk more about the importance of increasing racial and ethnic diversity in the profession of pharmacy? Yeah, this is another fantastic question. Um, and I'll, I'll be honest, I'll be at one that I, I probably haven't given uh, the proper amount of thought to until very, very recently. So um, for context, I am Indian American. Um, I'm very, uh, it's a beautiful culture. We just celebrated our festival of colors earlier this week. Um, and so it was uh, obviously in quarantine in, in this COVID world, it's really hard to celebrate any festival, but uh, it was very nice to be able to, to kind of do that. But so, so I went to Rutgers, it's a predominantly, um, there, there's a heavy Indian American population. And so I'll be honest, I, I wasn't really aware of race and, and my role of, of race in the profession because most of my classes were either Indian American, you were Korean American, you know, Chinese American, or whatever. So like there were all, you were basically of some sort of ethnic minority. But I, I think what was, you know, when I really started noticing this was, was as I started getting more engaged in the advocacy world and, and got involved with, with associations and leadership that ethnicity and racial diversity is very, very hard to find. And, and I think to, to sort of all of us like to see ourselves as individuals, right? Like, oh, I'm, a, I'm an individual. When I go into a setting, I bring my set of experiences with you. But I think the one thing we don't really talk about is we don't talk about what does it mean to be an individual of a race that is not white? And so when I went into, for example, the board table, right? When I was a member of the APHA board of trustees, I was maybe one of two people of color around that board table. And so while the, the, the white people in that room saw themselves as individuals, I think people of color historically, just because of our experiences in these, in, in any sort of environment where we might be one of few people of color, it becomes a group identity, that that whiteness becomes an automatic group identity. And that group identity really makes it hard for us to advocate for ourselves, our ideas, um, or, or really have our confidence to be able to kind of talk in that. So I think one, being engaged at a higher level of leadership and advocacy as a racial minority is important because it not only increases representation, which brings around backgrounds, but it also empowers other people of color to, to form this sort of group mentality to be able to talk about it. So it, how I act in a, in a leadership group where there's where I'm the only person of color versus if my if ethnicity or communities of color are the predominant representation is very, very different. And I've, I've required mentorship and coaching and, and, and help from from people to, to feel comfortable being able to be an advocate and to speak up, even if I'm the only person of color in that room, because if I'm not talking you know, it's sad to say, but, but, you know, as the only person of color in that room, I might be the only person or only advocate for those communities, even non-Indian American communities that are at that table. And so I think it's really important that more and more people get engaged in, in pharmacy and leadership to be able to do that. The other piece of this, and, and it wasn't until I left. So when I went to North Carolina, I was in rural North Carolina, like I said. And, and so as you can imagine, it's very homogeneous in its race, right? It's very, uh, very, very white. And so, Outside of the like, you and you have staff meetings, you know, like when we talk to a staff meeting with all the owners, nobody's talking about racial diversity, right? Nobody is talking about cultural competency or implicit bias training. All they're talking about is our, our patients are white, we're white, we know what, what's important for them. But, you know, I had a few patients that were black, I had a few patients that were Latino. Uh, or, or Latinx populations or Indian American. And so uh, even what I found was interesting is in those roles as a pharmacist and even my role now where I meet with constituents or stakeholders, there is whenever I'm on in front of a person on camera or in, in a room and there is another person of color, there is this like 
the, the sort of connection, right? We look at each other in this really, in this way where it's like the other person, uh, ought to, there's an acknowledgement that we understand what they're going through, right? Um, because we have that cultural background, we have that understanding. And, and while it's super fulfilling um, to know that you can connect with patients on a deeper level, it's also really sad because, you know, you, when you're talking to a patient or when you're talking to a stakeholder, you know, the fact that you might be the only person of color they ever talk to about this issue in a week or in a month or in a year, it's kind of sad. And, and so I, I think part, if, if we are going to be focused, if the profession is going to be focused on, you know, patient care and not just some of those issues we talked about, like payment reform or integration and coordination and provider status, I think increasing diversity is going to be an incredibly important thing because it allows patients to have connections. It allows patients to have trust with their healthcare providers. I mean, you know, one of the things that we saw uh, in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic is just how little faith and trust the um, communities of color have in our healthcare systems. And I still think it's a little bit of a cheap shot to just say that this is the, you know, Tuskegee, uh, uh, you know, experiment, that this is still uh, remnants of that because it doesn't do enough to acknowledge the biases that other healthcare providers do and continue to do in our healthcare systems. We know that uh, women of color, black women in particular are more likely, likely to die. Uh, in 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 uh, in during labor and, and child delivery, we know that more of them are likely to to not have pain symptoms taken seriously. We know that more of them are more likely to have chronic diseases. And so, if you start asking the questions, this is you know this is systemic racism, right? And 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 I don't want to I don't want to gear this too far off into the question, but you know all of these things we talk about, it's it's fact that systemic racism is a public health crisis. And so, when you look about how do we address some of those problems. The first way we're going to do it is by by representation. So if you have pharmacists that are of color and are they're engaging with providers, they're engaged in, in a coordinated care model, they're engaging with patients, and they can see themselves reflected in the healthcare system, I think that is going to do you know so much benefit uh, in it, in being able to bring down some of those trust issues and being able to mitigate some of those barriers. And so I I, I think that. In advocacy, right? If you're going to say, you know, uh, yes, it's important, but what are the stat strategies that we ought to look at? I mean, how do we facilitate uh, programs that to pharmacy schools that focus on on communities of color? How do we get leadership programs in these nonprofits to start building up leaders? Uh, who are from these ethnic diversities? Um, how do we utilize public health infrastructure? So, so for example, the National Health Service Corps. How do we use the National Health Service Corps and other loan repayment programs to start accepting pharmacists and then start targeting pharmacists of color so that when they go into these communities that are underserved, when they go into these communities that are uh, of high ethnic and, and high racial diversity populations, that we're doing the work, not just of providing care, but of rebuilding trust in our, inf uh, in our institutions and of making sure that patients can see themselves when they go to the providers to get care. Thank you, Dr. Jindal, that was amazing. I especially important, it's especially important to address the importance of increasing the recognition and the diversity of representation of people of color in the profession of pharmacy. And in fact, um, PLW actually had a social media campaign this past month um, during the month of March, which is called uh, Pharmacy Advocacy Month. And we addressed several topics along with the diversity of communities of color and LGBTQ communities. Uh, we'll talk about it more later on at the end of the presentation, but I just think like it all ties in all together. And I think we really do need to advocate more for people who, you know, we need to have this equal amount of healthcare for everybody, regardless of their background and their ethnicities. And uh, Shivani, if you wanna take it away with our last question. Yes, thank you, Rachel. So this is our last question for tonight for all of our panelists. How can students advocate for the profession of pharmacy and be the prescription for action? And we will start with Dr. Schweitzer followed by Dr. Jindal and Dr. Murphy. Well, I'll keep it short because I want to get to the questions. <laughs> so um, we, it's little pearls have been kind of weaved all through the conversation listening to all this. So I would say if I could think of one thing that people do is I, Everybody has a family and you all have issues with the health system, you know, having to deal with it. I would just, if I were each one of you, next time something comes up in the family, like get engaged and figure out why and solve it. 
When I say solve it, once you understand it and dig into it, you can write that issue up and submit it to a legislator or figure out what's causing what, what the, it, and I'll just give you an example. My mom was in an assisted living home and you know they called up and she needed time. Well, just give her some Tylenol. Well, the law was you can't give her Tylenol. So you know I have to get off work, go over there and give Tylenol. This is a ridiculous law. So that's an example, let's fix this. And it's just one small thing, but if you work it all the way through, you can solve it. So I just, if you start with something and get involved and you know, um, I think that's, you'll see that, that you can make a change. So anyway, that's my suggestion. Thank you, Dr. Schweitzer for sharing that with us. Dr. Jindal? Yeah, I would say the best outside of everything else that people are going to say, if I'm going to find something a little more unique, uh, get engaged with things outside of the profession. Um, you know, bring on, uh, fi find opportunities to, to make allies with other healthcare providers, understand what they're going through so that you can better understand their narrative and their perspective so that when you read a headline that says the AMA is opposed to something, you actually understand why they're opposed to it as opposed to just they hate pharmacists, which is not necessarily true. And the second thing I would say is, you know, take advantage of, of politics, right? Take advantage of understanding the institution pieces. I'm a big fan of that. I volunteered for a ton of campaigns throughout high school, throughout college, throughout pharmacy school. Um, and I think every time I got engaged, I learned something new about how decisions are made. I think it's great to have an idea. I think it's great to be able to write a letter. But honestly, if you don't have an understanding or you're not able to, to strategize how to take that idea and pass it into a law, or how to take that idea and get it in front of the right stakeholders so that it gets uh, enacted into a regulation somewhere, then your idea is just an idea. And so I think being able to get engaged with politics is helpful because A, you learn that institution, but B, you also build an incredible network outside of the pharmacy space um, to be able to lean on whenever you have a question or whenever you do need to take advantage of an opportunity or whenever you do wanna advocate for a certain position. So I think some of those non-traditional pathways um, are, are super advantageous in this space as well. Thank you, Dr. Jindal for sharing that with us as well. Dr. Murphy? Oh, those are hard things to follow. So I'll, I'll share and I'll, I'll be quick. Um, I would challenge you every day to do one thing that uh, forces you to step outside of your comfort zone. And, um, and really think about and reflect on how that thing can help to move forward patient care in the healthcare system. Um, it can be something small. It could be writing a letter. It could be volunteering for a political campaign like Dr. Jindal said, or it could even be reaching out to um, a speaker that you saw speak and say, hey, I, I, I want to get to know you a little bit more. Uh, heck, that's what I did with Dr. Schweitzer when she talked at an APHA annual meeting uh, several years ago, and I was a P1 student, and I said, wow, she is incredible. I, I really want to meet her. And I, I went up and just introduced myself. So do that same thing. Do one thing every day and just step out of your comfort zone and say and reflect on how can I move forward patient care in just a tiny, tiny little way. Uh, and and we, if we all do that, um, we'll be pretty, it's going to be pretty exciting to see all of the positive change that comes from that. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Murphy. That was really inspiring. Rachel? Um, so we'd just like to thank you all for sharing your advocacy experiences and giving us, uh, all the students on the call, an idea of how they can also advocate for change. Unfortunately, I know it's getting pretty late, especially for our East Coast um, audience members. So out of respect of time, we don't have uh, time to ask any other further questions. Uh, but if you'd like to ask any of our panelists questions, feel free to email us. We'll drop our email inside the chat box as well. Um, so we'll pass on those questions to our panelists. And um, I'll, now, I'll now pass it on to April to complete our closing statements. Thanks everyone. I really love the engagement um, in the chat as well. So we'll be sure to share the recording link as well as any of the questions to our panelists. Um, Again, please give a warm virtual round of applause to our panelists today for joining us and talking about having a seat at the table as pharmacists wherever any of these um, healthcare decisions are being made. Um, Shivani, if you can advance to the next slide. 
While we wait for any last minute raffle entries, feel free to reach out to Pharmacy Legislative Week through our email, which Christine will drop, any of the links we have here. Um, you can apply to join the team or follow the Grassroots Pharmacist as well, which has a ton of educational and very engaging and relevant content. Again, this is the last call to enter the raffle before Shivani announces the winners. Thank you, April. We'll give one minute to everybody in case if you want, if you'd like to enter for the raffle. And while we're doing that, um, Shivani can go ahead and stop sharing and we'll take screenshots of folks before everyone has to hop off. Do you appreciate folks for staying on for so long and want to turn on your video? I know we have um, a lot of people here tonight, so we'll take photos of both pages of participants. And then Christine and Rachel, if you can count us down again. Um, also, if you have any questions for the specific panelists, um, just send them to us and then we will relay it to them and have them contact you, okay? All right, so photo time. I think uh, we learned our lesson the first time. Uh, so I'll count down um, and then on three, we'll all say cheese and smile, okay? One, two, three. And then next page. Counting down on three, one, two, three. Awesome, you all did a great job, you look beautiful. Thank you, Rachel and Christine. And now we would go ahead and announce our winners for tonight. Our first winner is Ellen Trin from the University of Hawaii at Hilo College of Pharmacy. If everybody could just cheer them up. Our second winner for tonight is Rachel Whitsitt from the University of Iowa. And our third winner for the night is Mark Loco from Roseman University in Nevada. I think that's Christine and um, Rachel's university. So thank you everyone for coming tonight. We will email you your virtual gift cards. And if you did not win today, you can join the PLW and Capsi Pharmacy Advocacy Month raffle by visiting our link tree. Um, I think we posted the link tree in the chat. Again, thank you everyone for joining. We really appreciate your time. Thank you to all our panelists for coming and joining us tonight and speaking for us. And if you have any questions, um, feel free to email us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. And PLW folks, if you could just stay on a little bit longer, we'll take a group photo with our lovely backgrounds.